Okay, today, uh, the, the goal of uh, the first hour, the first class today, is uh, uh, to discuss about uh, the definition of uh, ambient intelligence in general, and specifically how this definition applies to the kind of projects uh, we are going to develop this year. Okay, so we'll set up the, the constraints, uh, the perimeter within uh, which uh, you will uh, work and develop your project. So. First of all, we spend some time in analyzing and proposing and analyzing a definition, and then we see something more, uh, say, practical, more concrete about uh, the theme of the year. So we'll try to discuss uh, um, the, the topic of the year. Hmm? And uh, so uh, let me just be very quick here, uh, saying that uh, the kind of technologies that we are using here are actually in the evolution of a series of different uh, technology waves uh, uh, that came one of the after the other in the past years uh, and that here are more or less summarized the, these are all keywords uh, that you know maybe you don't know in detail but for sure all of these keywords are already well known in particular today a lot of people are talking about uh, the internet of things uh, what is the relationship about uh, between these technologies and what we are doing in ambient intelligence well, actually we are building on top of all of these technologies. So we already witnessed uh, some sort of integration or collaboration of these different techniques uh, that uh, uh, were developed in different uh, case studies for different uh, preventive purposes. But uh, um, especially what uh, we are trying to do here is to reason about uh, how to serve the users with all of these technologies and what kind of applications can be built uh, with all these technologies for the users. So actually what we are adding is uh, to a, a lot of technologies we are adding the point of view of the users and the point of view of uh, the application. So what, we, what do we do with all these devices? What do we do with all these technologies? Hmm? What are the features that we are creating by assembling technologies and they are, we are delivering to the user. This is kind of our point of view hmm, in which uh, ambient intelligence lives. So ambient intelligence is not uh, developing new or different technologies, is using the current technologies in order to satisfy the user needs. Hmm? And uh, if, uh, as with any buzzword or keyword, there, is, there isn't a single definition for ambient intelligence uh, every researcher research group uh, have their favorite way of putting uh, uh, the definition but actually it's not a new term hmm? it's something that maybe you have only known uh, when you saw this course in the in the, in the list of uh, uh, possible courses but actually if you look back in time already in 2010 the uh, European Commission published a study called the Scenarios for Ambient Intelligence in 2010. Actually, this publication, oh sorry, uh, was published in 2001. And in 2001, so at the beginning of the century, they started looking forward to 2010 and say, okay, what will happen in 10 years in the field of ambient intelligence? Mm -hmm. So this work was done in the year 99, 2000, and was published in 2001 describing what will happen in the next 10 years. If we read it now, which is nearly 20 years later, uh, it, you can read it, so it's online, uh, you find that a lot of the scenarios, real life scenarios, so the, the, the type of behaviors that the users have in this kind of uh, descriptions, they are, it's very easy to read, it's not very technical, it describes what people will do in 2010. Okay, now we are in 2017, most of these scenarios are not yet realized. Okay, so it was a, a prediction that tries to predict the future, but actually uh, it's still not, not really valid because something has changed, but uh, uh, there are still a lot of uh, um, areas that were already predicted 20 years ago for which we still don't have a solution today. Hmm? So it's still a, 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 a very active field. Um, there are many, uh, sorry, in, in this uh, in this report, the the there was not a specific definition, but actually, there was 
describing a new society in which uh, the environment was more user-friendly, that uh, um, allowed more easier uh, user interactions, e user interfaces would be more intuitive, more intelligent, this had happened actually, and especially uh, all kinds of objects uh, and also the environment uh, can recognize and respond to the presence of individuals. Hmm? So this is not really happening today, hmm? yet. Uh, it was not the only definition. During the years, the, there were uh, very, var various, let's say, variations, various sentences that try to, to describe uh, uh, what I mean intelligence is. Uh, I, I will focus mainly on this, which is very short. We've already shown it before. A very short definition, but uh, I think it captures the essence of what you are trying to do. Uh, a name is intelligence system, so what you're trying to do is a digital environment. No doubt about that. No doubt, we, we need the digital technologies, we need sensors, we need actuator, we need computer, we need interfaces, we need mobile devices, and so on. All of these digital technologies, for what? For supporting people in their daily life. So it's not technology because technology is good, or because we like it, it's technology because it solves some specific uh, problem or helps in some specific way the users in their daily life, in their work, in their, while they're traveling, while they're living, while they're enjoying themselves or any other moment of their life. So in our life, in our day, we have different activities. And each of these activities could be improved by an intelligent digital system surrounding us. Uh, they should be, we already mentioned that, proactive and sensible. Proactive means uh, we should be able to understand what we want and propose solutions, also act, do something for helping us, even if we don't ask for it explicitly, even if we, even, even before uh, we, are, we realize we want it. So the system should be able to propose something, to do something, and not just react to my comment. This is where intelligence is. But at the same time, it should be sensible, so uh, don't overdo, don't do too much, or, don't, or be careful not to do something that could be in contrast with the will of the user. Uh, what I always say is that uh, um, the line that divides maybe a um, a wonder house, imagine a house uh, in which you have uh, all sorts of automation, all sorts of uh, some, some, um, something that you live in a, in a very wonderful place, so if, like a fairy house, huh? uh, can turn into a wicked house very easily. Uh, if you have a lot of automation but does exactly the opposite of what you want, uh, you are in a wicked house, uh, you are in a horror movie where everything is against you. So the line between helping you and or you loving the environment uh, or um, creating new problems and so you hating the environment or you feeling uh, captive inside an environment that does something different. Okay, so when you are in a, you know, in a lift, you start pressing button, you don't understand what it does because it's too intelligent, to, it thinks it knows what to do. Huh? So we want to avoid these situations in which the system take, takes over and the user is no longer in control. We want to be in control, but we, want to don't, we don't want to give all the details about every single action that we want. Hmm? So having something which is intelligent, but friendly. Uh, so this is our sh very short but definition, but every word uh, no, uh, is able to guide us in the, in the design. Uh, this is another definition, more or less equivalent, is called the intelligent environment instead of uh, ambient intelligence. Uh, but uh, again, uh, you see that the focus uh, is always, uh, I, I wrote that in red, uh, about enhancing the, the occupancy experience. This definition goes more into details about how the technology is organized, what is the say, software architecture that should work, but we, we are not really interested in that. Um, we are more interested in putting the users first, putting the users' needs first. Okay. Um, and for realizing that, uh, for realizing the result, uh, we need uh, to integrate a lot of technologies. So we don't want the users to think about technology. We don't want the users to 
uh, see the technology in many cases. You want to hide it as much as possible. You want the user to be happy in their environment, to be happy in their activities. Uh, but of course, for doing that, we need a lot of uh, software, we need a lot of devices, sensors, and actuators. Uh, we need good interfaces. We need some uh, in artificial intelligence uh, for predicting uh, what the user wants. Uh, we need some uh, pervasive computing means uh, having the capability of putting a lot of small computers everywhere in the environment. Uh, and of course, we need a lot of uh, net connectivity and network connectivity between all the different stuff. So all of these technologies are put together in a way that is more or less invisible to the user uh, in order to provide him uh, or her services. To simplify that, uh, uh, we define an ambient intelligence system as a system that always implements and cycles through these four major steps. So each one of our projects uh, will have uh, these four steps. If, if one of them is missing, there is not an ambient intelligence system and it will not be valid, okay? It's something else, but it will want, we wouldn't call it ambient intelligence. And the four steps are sensing, reasoning, acting, and interacting, we call them. So the system should be able to sense something, so measure something from the world. Imagine you are a computer system. You need to understand, to know, to get some information from the environment and from the user. Sense what's happening through sensors or something like that. And then when you get the data, you need to reason about this data. What is happening? I have this temperature, this presence detection, this location information, this movement information and so on. Uh, what does it mean? Does it mean that I need to switch the lights on? Does it mean that they need to switch the music off or whatever? So we need to do some reasoning to understand from the data we collect from the field what they mean and what actions uh, we need to apply on the environment. And so the next step will be the acting. Acting means uh, the system, the ambient system, changes the environment, does something onto the environment. Changes lights, uh, temperature, sound, uh, uh, moves some objects, uh, move a, a robot, uh, closes a window, uh, plays a sound, uh, or whatever. Something that changes actually the state of the environment. And uh, the last step would, would be the user that in some way interacts with the system. And the user will interact in two ways with the system. First, through the environment. So if I'm moving inside an environment that has sensors for the presence of, of people, the fact that I'm here or the fact that I'm moving is already an interaction with the system. I'm not interacting with a computer, with a screen. I'm moving in a room, but this is an, inf it's an input information to the system. And uh, if the, as I move, the lights change, I'm receiving information from the system. I'm aware that something intelligent behind the walls or somewhere uh, is interacting with me. So there is uh, some interaction which is already happening through the environment. The user lives in the environment, the system senses and act, acts, uh, sensing and acting on the environment. But this usually is not enough. We usually also need some sort of explicit interaction. So some screens, some websites, some mobile application where the user can give more specification, give more command, respond, and so on. So uh, every emergency system also needs to specify how it interacts with the user, through the environment or through explicit interface. Hmm? These four steps are essential. Sensing. Sensing means uh, getting information from, from the environment or from the user. Or both, of course. From uh, the environment, uh, uh, here I summarize some 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 examples of sensors. Uh, we sh we show a bigger picture later. And here we are trying to summarize something that uh, monitors in some way what the user is doing, like bracelet with accelerometers uh, or cameras that see what you're doing or microphone. That listen to what you're saying or what noises you're making and so on. Hmm? So sensing is uh, 
realized through sensors, as the, as the name says, that are connected in some way with sensor networks, with Wi-Fi, with Bluetooth, with mm, uh, various technologies uh, that are, can be wire technology with wires uh, in a USB key, a USB cable that, that uh, fits this camera, for example, or a wireless connection in some way. Uh, they can be independent sensors, like for example, that one is a fire sensor in, on the ceiling, and it only has that single function. It is a fire sensor. That's it. But, or I may have maybe 15 different sensors in my, in my smartphone. Uh, so sensors may be individual devices or embedded into other devices. The camera of your laptop is a sensor, uh, and, uh, and so on. Uh, this sensor can be measuring ambient quantities, and in the, in the ambient, it can measure temperature, it can me measure uh, light, it can measure noise levels, I can measure the pollution of the air, I can measure the, um, the air flow, for example, so the, the movement of the air, uh, and so on. I can measure the number of people that are in a place. Uh, I can, what can I measure about uh, an, an, an ambient? Uh, a lot of different measurements. Uh, can be, I can measure the presence of fires, for example, the presence of people or not, the fact that doors are open or closed. I can have door sensors, window sensors, and so on. So a lot of many different um, physical quantities can be measured onto an environment. But also, and here we have some examples, of types of sensors. Hmm? I, I would say that any physical quantity that, that you define, that you can define, can be measured, can be sensed through any kind, some kind of sensor. And actually, today on the market, there are really sensors for everything. Huh? You name it. You name it, you find a sensor. A sensor that can be a standalone device, like this one in the picture, or it can be an embedded device that you can plug into your Arduino or Raspberry. Uh, board uh, uh, that just is connected to that specific device. Hmm? So we are not limited by the types of quantity or physical quantity that you we, you, we can measure. Because really, okay, well maybe we don't have everything in the lab, but on the market you find everything at reasonable prices hmm, for for any kind of, uh, of physical quantity. Hmm? So the input to the system will be a set of these measurements. And also, uh, some measurements can be took uh, on the users. Mm. The user can wear something, or, or it can be monitored, maybe from a distance with a presence sensor, with a camera, or the user can wear something that is able to track his movement, uh, track his uh, heart rate, uh, track his body temperature, track uh, his uh, physical activity, track his stress level, track this. Uh, uh, sweating, uh, that is also correlated with the stress, uh, track the bio um, resistance of the skin, and there are, I, again, you name them, uh, there are uh, hundreds of different sensors that can be used to measure different uh, types uh, of uh, information about the user. So the direction which he are, is looking, uh, so the gaze direction, you name them. Hmm? Uh, these ones are <laughs> about wave uh, um, um, brain waves, sorry, uh, so trying to understand how we are th how we are thinking, uh, not what you're thinking, not yet, but at least uh, uh, some kind of emotions or some kind of, of motor actions and so on. So we have a, a universe hmm, of these devices. We try not to, in this course, uh, we always try to use something that is already existing. So trying to find in lab or on the market the kind of sensing device that we need, uh, because developing any of these will be a lot more work, uh, a lot more electronics works, uh, work, uh, and we don't want to spend too much time in, in creating a sensor and uh, guarantee it's, uh, it's a quality, the quality of the data that is measured. Hmm? Uh, the problem, well, there are many problems with sensors. Actually, uh, they, they generate data. And these data are just numbers. So our system not only should measure these numbers, so our goal is not to deploy sensors and let them push data somewhere. 
we want to get this data and make sense of that understand what it means processing this data and this data is huge just imagine having many sensors generating data every few seconds you are filling terabytes every day hmm? uh, they are noisy usually the sensors are maybe if they are wireless they don't have always connectivity so sometimes you have the data sometimes you don't and the uh, quality of for cost reason the quality of the sensor is not very high it's not very certified so there will be a lot of uh, measurement errors and fluctuations and so on so you need to you need to filter this data uh, there could we will be missing points there will be sensors that maybe measure the same sensor from different brands for example measure the same quantity but they are not directly comparable mm -hmm. they maybe they use different units of measure or they are di different settings of different zero settings so to compare data coming from different different sensors you need to adjust them because they are not homogeneous um, they depend on when and where you take the measurements and so on so there's a lot there's a, there's a whole world this is just the beginning of the big data world or the data science world that we are talking about uh, a uh, lot of people are talking about today huh? we don't want to get caught into that big complexity we are aware that these data are need to be treated carefully but we'll try in this course we'll try to take some shortcuts huh? because otherwise here is another place where we get uh, uh, say a very, very high complexity and we would need to focus too much time on the data processing on the signal processing on finding the right spot on finding the right uh, transformation of the data and uh, we won't have much more time to think about the user. Remember that our first point should be the user, the functionality for the user. Okay, reasoning is the easiest because it means programming. It means learning to program a system that should be able to uh, implement the functionality that we want to, to deliver to the user. Mm -hmm. So we learn uh, some technologies for programming this kind of system that integrate different uh, sensors uh, we try to learn the protocols through which we can easily query and send comments and get information for this uh, kind of devices an ambient intelligence system is a distributed system it has different computational nodes you have the smartphone you have a gateway you have a sensor each of them has a cpu runs a different program and you need to be able to uh, integrate the communication and let them communicate and create an overall application that runs in different places mm. so we learn uh, some easy prototype level technologies for creating this kind of, uh, of application so this is most uh, of the technology classes in the course will be for learning how to create prototypes with uh, we chose the use the, to use the Python language and the Raspberry boards uh, because they are really flexible and very easy to, to, to use for creating a prototype not maybe the final version of a product that got on, to, on on the shelf but for creating in a short time a complete prototype uh, Python is very good it's also very helpful in uh, uh, in all the stuff about network connectivity it does have a lot of libraries modules ready for talking with different kinds of devices so lo a lot of trivial problems that would be killing you if you if you were programming in C uh, they are already solved uh, by, by using an high level language hmm? like that so we spend time in, in learning that um, and what what do the reasoning part uh, or the reasoning software need to do well actually you need to get the data interpret the data interpret the, the needs of the user so if the user there is not what does it like what does it like so make a model of the user and the, on the basis of the model of the environment and the model of the user and uh, it decides it decides what to do at the end uh, the reasoning part should be making some decisions based on a set of data that it collects uh, or it monitors or based on a local history based on uh, some algorithm based on uh, what Google says uh, about the weather, about the traffic, about uh, the forecasting or whatever. Hmm? So this is the, uh, the, the main goal. Uh, th that will be, of course, the more specific. Every, every project will have a different uh, mm, goal in the original part. The acting is the, the, the reverse of the sensing. So why in the sensing we are measuring something from the environment? In the acting part, we are changing 
some characteristic of the environment through home automation devices maybe you have a, a smart home where everything is automated uh, through independent uh, devices like these uh, light bulbs uh, from from Philips that are uh, that, that, that are can be programmed uh, wirelessly uh, independently from uh, you don't need any smart home uh, uh, say plant uh, you just need to 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 to, to to put the plug uh, uh, in place uh, and, and, and program that. Uh, so there are many devices that can help you change something in the environment. So for example, through home automation, you can change doors, open and close them, change lights, uh, change the color, change the intensity, open and closing windows, change the, the, the temperature, uh, you know, switching a fan on, so creating or stopping an, an airflow or no? Um, this kind of this kind of, uh, of actions onto the environment. Uh, um, you can also think about acting on the user, so you are giving the user a, a vibration and notify the user through a vibration, through a sound, uh, for example. So you are delivering information on the user. I don't know if the user is wearing some sort of smart glasses. You can change. Uh, the reflection level of the shielding level of the glasses so you are changing something actually hmm, on the user and uh, uh, the next step would be also to have a robot uh, something that moves uh, in the environment and goes to the user go somewhere else uh, or maybe uh, is it for for letting your dog or your cat playing with the robot that moves or something like that so in any case something physical is changing lights sounds positions, movements. This is often the, the hardest, hardest part of your project, thinking about how you can change the environment to help the user. And this is what makes the, the environment intelligent. You find a lot of projects, if you search in the internet, that have a very strong uh, sensing and reasoning part. They gather data and then give you a lot of charts and pictures uh, and dashboards uh, and uh, but then it's only data which is there and you, the, user, the human needs to go and check the data and read them. I'm, I'm consuming too much energy, too less energy or whatever. Uh, they are just uh, collecting the data and analyzing that for you. In ambient intelligence, we also want to do the next step. Once the system has the data analyzed, does something for the user. Doesn't wait for the user to come and read the data. This is probably one big difference between uh, many systems that you find in the market. When you, you sell a product, this product usually collects data and, uh, and gives you a, an app, for example, for, show, for, for reading that. Huh? Uh, but a general product doesn't know how your home is made, how your, how your office is made. So a product that you buy in the market uh, usually doesn't have the capability of changing something in your house because it doesn't know what is there. So we try to put the system into a context. I know that the system will be in this room, in a classroom, in the house, in the office, in the corridor, in the in, in, in a forest, I don't know. But we know the context. And so we can think about how to change the context. We are not interested in selling a, a, a product that has only a limited function. We are interested in a transforming an environment. So the, the, the starting point is the knowledge about the environment, and so we can decide how to act on that specific environment. And the final step is interaction. So interacting with the user through the usage of uh, web interfaces, mobile interfaces, wearable interfaces, environmental interfaces, like changing the light to advise the user that something is happening, uh, these are big uh, speakers that may be, uh, can be used to give some, uh, you know, the speakers are connected to the fire detector. When the fire detector sensors uh, uh, fire, the speaker will send a message saying, okay, please go out and so on. Um, and uh, interacting with the user can also be done not just through applications, web application, mobile application, but also through the environment itself, through the switches in the house through the move, your, your own natural movements in the house and so on. So trying to 
think about which is the best way for the user to interact the with the system. Uh, remember, interacting is a two-way word. Interaction means the user gives information to the system and the system gives information to the user in different, with different channels, with sight, with hearing, with touch. So try to think about what kind of information the user should provide explicitly to the system in addition to what the system is, also, is already able to sense, to measure, and think about what information the system needs to provide to the user in addition to the information that is already providing by changing the environment. So we have this double channel, interacting through the environment or interacting through some interface. Of course, these are general concepts. We need to map them into the specific project. Um, okay, I like these two tweets. I just want to mention them briefly that are for, from three years ago. That actually say that uh, all of this stuff, uh, for all these uh, scenarios that we are discussing in ambient intelligence, the technology is already there. Most of what we need uh, is already existing. What we need to do still is to engage the users into the system. We see a lot of demos or smart cities or something like that, but what I see is are demos of smart technologies, not of smart cities or smart environments, uh, because the users are just there and go and see and say, okay, that's nice, but it doesn't change my life in any way. Hmm? And uh, this is what we are trying this ambient intelligence course to, to push you to, to think about. Think about the user, how to sell to the user this kind of new uh, solution. And it can be applied everywhere. I mean, it can be applied to your home, to a building, to an office, to a hospital, to a school, to a bus, to a, um, a square in the city, uh, to a train, uh, to a any kind of environment uh, encloses some activities for the users. And each of these activity can be the object of some more intelligence uh, or can be improved by the ambient intelligence system. So actually, we are, I'm pushing you to, to think widely, hmm? widely and widely. So in a wide way and also with a very broad approach about the kind of uh, locations, the kind of activities that the user can do and so the kind of intelligence that the user can put. Um, so the, the four steps, uh, I will repeat them probably 95 times during the, the course, uh, sensing, reasoning, acting, and interacting are the cornerstone of every project. And then we have some additional features, char specific characteristics that are, that should be, let's say, um, supported or implemented by an ambient intelligence system, by an MEI system. And we, by Browsing the literature, I came out with these six concepts uh, that are most uh, demanded, the most requested, the most mentioned. So an MIT system, an MEI system, should have more or less hmm, all of these features. While the four steps are essential because are the basic working, while doing these four steps, uh, we try, we should have a system that is uh, sensitive, and responsive. I, I put them together because actually these two summarize also the cycle of the four steps. So uh, an MEA system should be able to sense the environment, sense the occupant, and also, of course, be able to process this data that is being sensed, and should be able to respond to user needs, meaning it should be able to act on the environment. Hmm? This is the starting point of every system should have a sensing part, should have a responding part, uh, or acting part, as you want to call that. The system should be, if possible, notice I cha I'm changing the verbs. The four steps must be implemented. These features should be implemented. So if they are there, it's better, but they are not. Uh, not every project will be able to implement all the six of these features, because it depends also on the kind of project. So, but there are features that you should strive for uh, or try to include in your project to make it better. Hmm? Should be adaptive. 
adaptive meaning that it's if you run the system later the output will be different because the user moved because the time has changed because some sensor changed some value and so on so the system should be able to adapt its output it's not just a, you know an automatic door anybody walks by the door will open that's not adaptive. They always does the same thing. Our intelligent automated door maybe takes also into account the direction in which you're walking, maybe takes into account the time of the year, whether the office is open or closed, or a lot of other parameters, whether outside it's raining or not. And so maybe if it's cold, I won't open unless you're really close, close, or some other mm, uh, stupid information from the context. So having all this sensing will help us in making better decisions because the decision will be suited will be adapted to the specific context of the moment a context uh, is a strange word is a very general word uh, that means uh, the set of variables of interest in this time and in this place hmm? so uh, creating a system that doesn't react always in the same way Otherwise, it wouldn't be intelligent. It's an automated system, deterministic, predictive, but it's not necessarily intelligent if it doesn't have uh, this other adaptivity capability. An MEI system should be transparent. So the user should have the benefit of the MEI system without being required to explicitly interact with some computer. So the best computer is the computer that you don't see because it does something for you, but you don't need to power it on and push on the keyboard and, uh, and move the mouse or whatever. So a good ambient intelligence system is a system that does, isn't seen by the user. The user don't need to see it, don't need to be aware of it. They see a better shop. They see a better pair of glasses. They see a better whatever. But they don't see a computer that makes the shop better. They just see the mirror. They see the, the window, the shop window, hmm? trying to remove the computer physically and mentally from the user. When, I, when I'm making a phone call, physically, I'm speaking into the phone. You are never say, OK, I, let me speak into the phone for a moment. You say, I, let me call my friend. So the phone disappears because what you're doing is speaking to a friend. Uh, your action is not uh, interacting with the device. It is accomplishing some meaningful goal for you. Speaking into a phone is not a meaningful goal, okay? Unless we are really very bad. Um, and uh, the same here with the environment. Uh, I want to open the door. I don't want to open the application for unlocking the door. Okay? The computer is not natural. It's not an intuitive way of interacting. It's something that gets into the way of our interaction with the environment. So we try to think about uh, the environment that reacts itself. Of course, it needs computer somewhere, but it doesn't need to be in the hands of the users every time. The more it's hidden, the better. So this is a, this is a thought that is already 91, 2001, 2011, 25 years uh, that we are saying the more computers disappear, the better. You know a sector in which this already happened, the automotive sector. If you drive a car, that car will have probably 20 computers, but you are not aware of any one of them because you are just driving. And one computer would be behind your throttle, gas throttle pedal. Huh? And they will interpret what you are doing and try to uh, uh, fix the motor or injection or whatever. So you can use 20 computers at a time and not being aware of any of them. Hmm? So this is the, the kind of goal that we should have. Ubiquitous is another term say that uh, an ambient intelligence system should be ubiquitous or perverse is meaning uh, 
in many different places. You can put sensors or computers in different places in the environment. It's not a centralized system. It's not a big computer that does everything. Uh, it needs to be distributed in different parts, and every part and, and every, we will call them computational nodes, more or less powerful, will have a specific goal, a specific function. Hmm? Uh, people were talking at the science, science fiction level probably about the smart dust. You know, dust like uh, particles of grams that could be spread into the environment and could, could do sensing or computing. Okay, I, I don't believe we have the technology for that today yet. Of course, we don't have it. Uh, but the idea is that we have not one or two, but maybe 20 or 50 or 100 different nodes of sensors spread into the system, into the environment, that work together hmm, for, for the user. Um, we won't be able to do much of this in this core in our project. Uh, we will, of course, create a scaled down version. Well, we don't have hundreds of sensors, maybe we have two or three. Hmm? The minimum amount to show that the project is working. But the idea of the project should also think about this direction. And of course, uh, intelligent, and the intelligence, the intelligence part uh, is always in, oh, it's already in the name, uh, means try to incorporate uh, some kind of uh, you know, the, the adaptation, the contact awareness that we discussed in the adaptation part is already a form of intelligence. There are also more structured form of intelligence. Today, uh, well, in this year, in the last couple of years, uh, we found a lot of very easy to use intelligence algorithms over the, in the cloud, especially, uh, very big providers from, from Google, from Facebook, they, they publish a lot of algorithms uh, that are e actually easy to use uh, and embed some intelligence. Because creating your own intelligent algorithm will be a lot of work and will be for a different course, not this one. But today we have a lot of, uh, you know, imagine TensorFlow for image recognition, which is very famous, very powerful, and very uh, quite, not very, quite easy to use, actually. And it could be uh, used and give some more intelligence to, to your system. Hmm? So we, are, we try not to develop artificial intelligence in this course it would take a different course uh, but maybe to embed a bit of it uh, when when it's suitable of course hmm? you should not force it okay so these are definitions in general in abstract the characteristic that we will use to filter a project and say okay is this uh, an ambient intelligence project or is something else so the, my first question would be, does it cover the four basic steps? Does it have sensing, acting, interacting, and uh, reasoning? And if it does have all the four steps, that, does it uh, feature some of the six uh, uh, characteristics, ubiquity, sensitivity, intelligence, uh, reactivity, and so on? Hmm? So these uh, will tell us how fit your idea or your project is uh, for um, as an ambient intelligent project. Sorry, I picked up the wrong file. This one should be the correct one. Okay, so this year we have a specific topic that PowerPoint sooner or later will show you. Okay. And the topic of this year you already know is ambient intelligence for sustainability. So, from this definition that we gave of an MEI system, we try to make it narrower, more specific, and try to think together about how it does apply, uh, how this definition or the type of MEI system could apply to the topic of sustainability. So, the theme of the year, of course, is 2017, not 16. is ambient intelligence systems for sustainability. This is the definition. What does it mean? Sustainability is a very, very wide topic because actually we need to pull uh, 20 or some projects out of that, different ones. Not, mm, uh, as we, we don't want you to fight over similar ideas to make uh, different projects because 
there are not there's not enough space uh, sustainability includes a lot of different topics a lot of different areas uh, that can contribute to sustainability well the first that comes to mind is the energy energy consumption or energy production consuming less energy or producing some energy contributes to sustainability remember we don't want to make a solar panel roof in this project. We, we want, it, it won't be ambient intelligence because it doesn't involve the user. Solar panel just produce the energy. That's it. That would be an efficient plant, a technical structure in our house, but that will not involve our behavior in any way. We're trying to find places in which our behavior is improved or our behavior is affected in some way. That would be the difficult part. Because you don't find them in the market. You find solution for single part, for the sensing part, for the energy part, for the reasoning, for the power distribution, but we need to put them together into a whole system with a specific application goal. So just, uh, the energy world is relevant. So everything that has to do with the usage of energy or the production of energy, that includes the use. Nutrition. Nutrition means uh, what you eat, how often you eat, how much you drink, uh, um, where you buy, when you buy. And this also is an, it's an important part of sustainability of the ecosystem. Waste management. Huge problem. How to dispose of something that you don't need anymore? Everybody hates to do the waste management in your house, having 27 different beings uh, and, uh, and, and uh, delivering them in different days and in different places. Huh? So uh, but the waste means uh, managing the waste once it's produced uh, or reducing the waste, reducing the, the reasons to produce waste, maybe by acting sooner in the production chain or in the behavioral chain or reusing stuff. I'm not telling you which process you have to do. I'm just trying to you know, throw in the air some keywords so that maybe some of you say, okay, I could do this. Mobility, moving ourselves, moving goods, moving objects, moving people. And mobility includes transportation, the cars, buses, trains, and infrastructure, streets, traffic lights, parkings. These are very big topics. Some of the smaller topics, but still relevant, are buildings. Buildings contribute, uh, okay, and the energy consumption is strongly linked with the, what you do with a building. Comfort. Comfort says, okay, here is too hot in this room. It's too hot. Are we wasting energy for that? Yes. Are we getting thirsty for that? Yes. Are we getting uncomfortable with that? Yes. And why doesn't the intelligent system do something about that, hmm? for example? And so uh, it's, it's also an, another uh, one of the aspects. Comfort by itself is not uh, sustainability, but the effects of a discomfort could be. Water, food, that are linked to nutrition, or linked to, but water is for drinking, but also for uh, cooling, for warming up. So the water cycle uh, is uh, it's also important. Uh, um, clean water, less clean water. So the water from, the, from your tap uh, is clean, but from the discharge of the tap is not lo no longer clean, but it's not, not dirty yet. Hmm? And so can be reused, so a lot of ideas. Uh, vehicles, cars, smart cars, car sharing, smart trains, autonomous vehicles. There's a, a universe that is just starting to pop up in this, uh, in this period about what we can do intelligently inside a vehicle to improve the, the user experience, to improve the uh, 
consumption, the pollution, and all the transportation infrastructure, streets, traffic lights, parkings I mentioned, vehicle to vehicle communications. There are a lot of systems that you already hear. If you think about them, most of the systems that you find in, in the press, in the blogs or whatever, don't involve the users. The machine that breaks by itself. The traffic light that adapts uh, to the traffic. So where is the user there? This is just a passive element into a more clever system. We want to involve him. And uh, sustainability also depends on your lifestyle, your behavior. Hmm? If we were all dead, we would not consume any energy or any resource. Hmm? So living in some way is it's a problem from the, that point of view. And so changing the way of life, adapting or the awareness about the, the lifestyle. All the, the re renewable energies also in some way take place. Hmm? Uh, reusing, I uh, already mentioned that about the waste, uh, re reusing materials or using objects or using fluids, water, something like that. All the waste uh, topic is also linked to the production. So why do we need so much packaging, for example, hmm? in a given item? Can we use that? Can we have something that, you know, a smart fridge or whatever that just pours me the milk in the in, in my in my you know, in my glass instead of need to go there and buy something of plastic that contains I don't know uh, all the sharing economy means uh, doing the same getting the same results uh, with less uh, resources so everything is under the big umbrella of sustainability we need to find one of these or similar ideas and uh, ask ourselves, what, how can we improve the daily life of a user with an intelligent system or intelligent environment that surrounds the user? This is the question for creating the project. And, of course, this can be applied to different places. Right now, we we analyze the possible topics, but this can be in the home. So imagine your home or a room or the kitchen or the bathroom or the living room, the garage, in the car or in general in a vehicle, on the workplace. Workplace may be office, may be factory, may be uh, agriculture on the field, a restaurant, a restaurant can be a, a, a general restaurant, a bar, a canteen like that we have here for students or for, uh, for big numbers of people, hmm? uh, train, bus, hospital, so these are just examples, bikes, train station, bus station, airport. Hmm? So. Of course, each one of these places will have different, uh, will host different user activities, and this, each user activity may have impact on different sets or different topics of the sustainability spectrum. So, if you, if you cross all the location, all the types of topics, and all the activities that users are, are going are doing there, you find probably tens of thousands of combinations that are meaningful to base a project on. So, try to open no, the ideas. Um, so actually, what we are asking for you, from you, is to define a project with these essential features. So these are the criteria that we use uh, to, say, to say whether your project is okay or not. It's not... Uh, Sometimes people ask me, do you like this project? I don't care. Huh? Or, uh, I put it better, the fact that it, the project is uh, suitable for the course doesn't depend on whether I like it or not. Huh? We, are, we are defining some 
criteria that say whether the project is suitable or not. I may like it more or less, but it's not relevant, of course, in this context. So, essentially, the four steps should be present. And you will find difficulty, more difficulty, in the acting part. Because you have less examples, because it's more difficult also to, to do practically. Uh, so in many ideas, usually the acting part is very weak. Mm? But maybe you already have a very, very good project with strong on acting and, uh, and uh, less on sensing. I don't know. But statistically, I know that this is the most difficult part. So if one of these is missing, the project is not good. Consequence. Remember, what we need for doing this means that projects that are mobile only, so just everything on my smartphone, are not ambient intelligence. Yes, they can do some sensing, but they can do any acting. They can do, uh, they, they are not ubiquitous. They're just in one place. Hmm? So a mobile app is not an MEI system. Software only. Software runs inside a computer, inside a cage. Cannot do anything on the environment, just software. You need some actuator, you need some sensor, you need some interface without some real world physics object to be integrated with your software. So a very clever intelligent system that is able to predict everything. Okay, it's an intelligent system. It's not an ambient intelligent system. No cloud only. I built a website with a lot of cloud computation, gets all the information. Okay. But we need it to be deployed in a specific real space. We don't live in the cloud. Sometimes our mind lives in the cloud, but our body lives in a physical space. So the cloud can be one of the computational resources for doing some part of the features. But in the end, the beginning and the end of the project is the space, is the ambient. Again, no wearable only. So something, everything that works on my smartwatch or something like that. Hmm? Or hardware only. Very smart sensor that is able to measure all the neutrinos that go through this, war, this, uh, this room. Okay, you will get the Nobel Prize, but you won't get the MEI course huh? uh, if you are concentrating too much on the hardware. Okay. Or embedded only solution, something that only runs on a, on, a, on a board with a lot of sensor, but it's just there in the corner. Okay? Because all of these solutions tend to cut out the user. There are more traditional solutions that are, they are devices that do something with the user. But they fail to involve the environment. Hmm? This is not an additional requirement. It's just a logical consequence of this. Also, totally automated behind-the-scenes solutions are not MEI. If in my house I have a super-efficient Energy production system with the pro I'm producing from the sun, from the from the heat of the soil, from uh, the cars that are passing in the street and they're grabbing some energy from them, and uh, and everything contributes to give me energy. Great. It's not a bit intelligent because it doesn't involve the users. It's just a very efficient energy system. Good. Go to the energy engineering course and propose them. They will be happy. Because you have a very, uh, uh, very high efficiency, very, but the features you measure are on the efficiency of the system. Mm. It doesn't give any feature to the user, except maybe a lower power bill at the end of the month. But no interaction in everyday life, no improvement of the everyday activities. Remember the definition. Uh, Okay, we must have some sensing and we must have some actuation, some acting for every project. Sensing on the environment and or the user and or social variables that are connected to the user and or cloud services. You can query some cloud services. It's a sort of sensing. Uh, you, I want to know the temperature outside here. 
I have two ways, deploy a sensor or query Google Weather, Yahoo Weather, whatever, a service that gives me the information in some way that already gives me the data. So maybe some information is already available through some external services, cloud services. Some other information must be measured locally. It's all sort of sensing. You don't always need a physical sensor to sense a quantity because maybe somebody else already had the sensor and shared the data or predicted the data or estimated the data or something like that. Of course, you don't need to have all these kind of sensors in every project. Depending on what, what it makes sense. The starting point is always what are the features that you deliver to the users. And then we decide, okay, then what do I need to measure? What do I need to modify? What kind of algorithm do I need? But this is later. Okay, the user doesn't care about your algorithm. You can love them, okay, but the users don't care. The users just care about what the system as a whole is doing for them. No more, no less. And it should not be simply deterministic. So the reasoning, intelligence, adaptation should be there in some way. So it shouldn't be just uh, a very... Out yes, like, like, like a state machine you know, where you just have an input and then the output is always the same. It should in some way depend on some information about the user, about the time, about the context in general. Okay, it's just nothing more than, than we need to implement the four steps. The cloud, uh, cloud services are, or mobile services, are very useful today. So they allow us to reuse something that we already have, all the sensors in the smartphone, for example, or the fact that the smartphone can vibrate, can give notification, can play sounds, can show images that are all sort of acting, that deliver information to the user, or a, a way for creating user interface. And in the cloud, you find everything. You can find services for calendaring, for messaging, for uh, weather prediction, for, uh, for integrating some devices. So we are not against this kind of uh, cloud systems or mobile systems. They can be used as sensors, virtual sensors, software sensors, cloud sensors, or actuators in some way. The only requirement that we have uh, is that you should uh, also have at least something physical. So don't make a system with that only relies on, on, on information coming from the cloud and no information coming from the environment. That would not be eligible for, for MEI. Uh, we need to have some, at least some sensor local and some actuator in the environment. Then we can enrich them with some information that is outside on the cloud, on mobile applications, and so on. Hmm? These are the, the kind of, um, of the, the, um, the mandatory requirement. Four steps, integrate a piece of this and a piece of that, and uh, uh, can integrate something more. All the features are a plus, are something for helping you to make the project better. So it, actually the, the title is try to incorporate these features. If you are at the end, you, your system is not ubiquitous, okay. Hmm? These are not uh, uh, blocking criteria. It's just some features that help you huh? understand. Of course, they, it should be, some of these should be implemented because otherwise it wouldn't be probably useful. Hmm? But you don't need to Tick all of them. Some projects will be more maybe on the reasoning part, some, some will be more on the sensing part. Uh, it's, it's normal, okay? Because it depends on the type of project. But what we'll ask you is to describe uh, what is the sensitive part of the system? What is the responsive part? What is the adaptive part? And so on. Of course, you can also say this system doesn't have any adaptation. Hmm? Or as long as it's still uh, non-deterministic, as, as we said before. So the real criteria are this one and this list of, uh, of rules. Then we need to not just think about a good project, 
but we also need to realize it. So we have some additional constraints that are coming from the evil world in which we are living. For example, we can modify the infrastructure. We can decide that the rooms in, uh, in this class, sorry, the doors in this classroom will open automatically. But we, we are not allowed to modify them, to put motors or sensors on them. It's not our house. We cannot modify the, infra the real infrastructure. We say, okay, I have a very clever idea for a new smart car. Okay, but do we have the car in which you can open it and change it? Probably not. So we are limited in the type of project that we think uh, to small, smaller, let's say, or more local ideas uh, that can be realized on a table in the lab. Hmm? Additional devices are okay, means that if we want to add something to this room, you know, an intelligent uh, waste bin, for example, it's okay. We can imagine them, you can, we can try that in the lab, you can move in the in the classroom for testing or whatever. So we can add something as long as it's easy, it's safe and easy to remove, but we cannot modify uh, the lights, uh, for example, or the windows or of, of any place. Hmm? Uh, we should be feasible with the, the equipment, the existing equipment. So we will have, and the first time we go on the second one, the second time we go to the lab, uh, we see all the devices that are available in the lab, uh, so we can choose any of them that are already available, we try every year to buy something new. You can have some devices you own, or you buy, or you lend from a friend that can be used. Or uh, some devices that can be purchased. We have some sponsor companies that have some budget available for us uh, for buying some additional devices uh, when, we, when we see the need for them. Okay, a bit will happen probably around May when we have more detail about the project, we can maybe identify some specific device, hardware, sensor, actuator, whatever, that is not available, but we can ask the sponsor, can you provide us with that? Hmm? So we don't want, we try to think about something feasible, but we don't want to be too much limited about what is already in the lab. Hmm? We want to grow. But uh, uh, it should be easy to demonstrate. So during the exam, you will need to make a demo. When you come to the showcase, you need to make a demo in a different place. It's not in the Ladis, but it will be in a different place. And if you want to show it to somebody else, uh, you need to put it together and make an or or a, a demo. So it's, it should be something easy to move, easy to mount and dismount, and possibly easy to be moved. And... Uh, no permanent installation, no, nothing permanent. If in some case you need to install something in a fixed place, uh, we can do that in the Ladisp. Hmm? Or in maybe in my office or something like that, uh, some place that we have an under control. If the project really needs to have something that is fixed in a place. Hmm? But if possible, we try to avoid it. For you, because it would be easier for you to replicate the project somewhere else and show it to somebody else. Okay, so this uh, is uh, actually the input for uh, uh, the, the, the requirement for what you should do. What is that? Okay, um, I will try to spend some time also in uh, having a look at the responses that you gave in the, in the survey, but I'm not sure we have time, so I want to give you practical information now about how to proceed. So actually, now today is the whatever, 9th of March. We have a couple of weeks uh, until the 22nd. You have a couple of weeks uh, to come up with ideas and with groups, okay? So we have, you have time to discuss among yourself, to discuss with us about possible ideas. And what you need to submit uh, by the 22nd on a Google Docs uh, on this link. So it, the link is on the document. It's also on the website uh, of, of the course. So. And uh, the composition of the group uh, and the idea. And uh, we are not asking them now, but try to think already at the four MEI steps uh, and the six features that we mentioned, uh, whether they are embedded in your idea. 
right now we are not yet asking to list them. Okay, we are asking for something very short. I show you the, the, the template in 20 seconds. Then what happens? The, the, oh, by 20, 20 seconds, you upload this document, and during the 23rd, which is um, Thursday, here, uh, we will have the three hours for discussing this idea. Okay, we will revise the idea, say this is good, this is not good, this is, can be improved in this way or not, and so on. We need one day to go through your ideas and make a, some evaluation so that we can present them to you. So they need actually to be finished the day before. And we, we will spend the 23 and revising them so that we can discuss together on the same day. And for, at least for the ideas that are good, or that are accepted, by the next day you need to find, upload the final version. So this w first Google Doc is a draft. And then we will have a parallel one in which you have to cut and paste uh, the final version once uh, it's approved. What kind of information you need? Very simple. This is the, the template of the Google Drive document that you need to fill. So uh, you, you have to cut, cut and paste this block of text uh, that you find in the document. You paste it, you give a number to the group. One, the first one will be one, the second two and three and so on, so you, you may count. And uh, um, just to, and you define the team members who are the people in the group, normally four, ex exceptionally three, an acronym for the project, a short name, a title, one line or, or less, and a description, five to 10 lines, not longer, Describing the project from the user's point of view. Don't mention technologies nor devices. So what the system does. Hmm? So, example, team member, you say the matriculation number, last name, first name, so that we can link them with the, with your, the, the list of students. Uh, an email that could be the email from the Polytechnico or another email uh, the only important thing is that uh, you check that regularly because we will send communication mail messages on the mail that you that you specify there okay so if you have your personal email uh, that you check more frequently than the Polytechno mail put that there hmm? it's not official it's a tool for communication uh, the username that you register on, on github so if you haven't registered yet please do and write that username because we need them to create your repository your worker repositories on the github platform mm? because you don't have the permission to create them we need to create and so we need to give permission to the members of the group to the specific repository and the acronym of the project will be used for giving the name to the repository so find a good name and the role in the project so of the four team members who does what we don't know yet of course, we don't have the details about the project. I'm not asking for scheduling or detailed information. But the general role, what is your contribution to the project? Hmm? Bringing tea or coffee is not enough, okay? So how are uh, you helping? So these are some examples, software developer, front-end developer, back-end developer, mobile developer, hard developer physical designer, so for example, for creating mock-ups, uh, interfaces, uh, uh, or something like that. Hmm? Try to describe hmm, what you will do in the project. And uh, the description, there are actually two requirements. From the user's point of view, what are the benefits for the user? What are the features of the system for the user point of view? Try to explain that to your mother or your grandmother not to a fellow uh, not to a fellow engineer like you okay not from the technical point of view but from the user point of view why should people want this system how does it make their life easier hmm? the system does these things helps you in this way you are the engineer you know that it's feasible you know how it can be done the users don't need to know that the users only need to see how it makes their life better or their environment smart smarter 
don't mention technologies. I really mean it. I don't want to see Arduino, Raspberry, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, uh, Android, or, or any technology keyword here. At least for one month, we won't speak about technology. Because we, know, we want to be sure that the project makes sense, independent of all the, on the technology that we use to implement it. It makes sense by itself, by the features it delivers to the users. Then we will discuss about which technology can be used. We, we can start, we should start thinking about this technology, of course, because we, we must be sure that the project is feasible. But it's not part of the description of the project itself right now. It would be difficult not to mention any technology. But it's help you trying to extract the value of your idea. Value for whom? For the user. Okay. Mm, next time, uh, what, what we'll do is to try to, in these days, from our side, but also you, if, if you find some strange ideas, some something on the internet, something on uh, on Kickstarter or whatever, maybe we can share it on Facebook. Share and comment. Oh, this will be good. Of course, we won't find probably any MEI project just to copy, hmm? because uh, it will be lacking some of the steps. But it probably could be an idea that some of us could improve increment. So we will try to share something. You also can do that. And uh, next time, uh, we try also to discuss, to comment uh, on the responses that some of you gave on the initial questionnaire, just to the exercise uh, to see whether they would fit uh, in this kind of definition. So right now we have a break and later on we start with Python.